So I'm going to talk about um, AIML workflows for gravitational waves. And um, I'll talk about how actually we've been using the NRP to really kind of push, push this forward. Um, so I don't need to remind you that there's kind of a computing revolution going on. Um, there's kind of the rise of hydrogen, hydrogen, heterogeneity. Um, it's really um, often been enabled by deep learning, right? So deep learning allows us to um, kind of take advantage of uh, parallel processing and th you know processors like GPUs and FPGAs and all the other kind of fun new ones um, give us kind of huge dramatic speed ups, right? Um, and kind of the conventional benchmark, conventional benchmark of an image neural network, right? You can get something like a factor of a thousand speed up, right? If you compare a single CPU core and an FPGA. Um, and you can get even like a factor of almost 100,000 right at the moment, you know, if you go to the kind of latest GPUs. Um, and so this kind of realization uh, a few years ago led us to build uh, an institute. So this is an, an NSF institute um, harnessing from the harnessing the data revolution kind of domain or call or whatever you call it. Um, and the idea was to kind of develop um, uh, uh, real-time applications for large-scale science experiments. In fact, I should backtrack. We actually founded, before we founded the institute, we founded a kind of community we called the Fast Machine Learning for Science uh, community. And our goal here, both with our institute, which is called A3D3, and at Fast Machine Learning for Science, is to address the problem of real-time AI in science. Um, and really, it's, it's about bringing ma machine learning workflows heter and heterogeneous computing to scale, right? Um, and so we want to bring this to kind of large scale experiments, um, in, in this case, physics experiments. Um, and so we're looking at kind of developing machine learning and GPU integration for large throughput commuting. And then also um, for machine learning on kind of specialized uh, FPGAs and ASICs for low latency computing, when you have to deal with, you know, kind of low latency decisions that you get sometimes at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, but the kind of bigger message, and it, it comes in this plot, is that science benchmarks are competitive with the other kind of AI benchmarks in the rest of the world. And so um, this is kind of a detailed plot, but the y-axis here is the um, ability to stream data, right? So you can see that the, the LHC uh, you know, streams data at rates like Google Cloud, as well as neutrino experiments like Dune and so on. Um, LIGO's not so far behind. Um, and the latency requirements are in some sense kind of you know, even more extreme than what we get from industry or, you know, what you would need, for example, on Netflix. Um, and so the point being is that, you know, we want to take many of the ideas that are coming from industry, but then kind of bring them into science and actually potentially push them further, right? Um, so now I want to talk about gravitational waves. Um, I'll start with the kind of, you know, simplest explanation. Um, so gravitational waves start, it's produced in kind of large catastrophic events in the universe. Um, you know, the typical things we see are so-called so uh, compact binary coalescence, where you have um, two objects merge, uh, and then they produce an you know, incredible explosion. Um, these objects could be black holes. In this case, it's a neutron star merger. Um, and then you get all sorts of radiation, you know, visible light radiation. But before that, you know, going at the speed of light, you get gravitational waves, right? Um, and the goal of LIGO is to identify these gravitational waves and um, detect them. Um, and so the challenge of detecting these uh, is pretty remarkable. Um, the kind of scale that we're looking for are kind of modifications in the kind of space-time fabric on the order of 10 to the minus 22. Um, this translates to a, a deviation, right? If you have a distance, a deviation of 10 to the minus 19 meters, right, over a four kilometer length, right? Um, this is many, many orders of magnitude smaller than the size of a, a nucleus, right? So you're talking about incredibly small amounts. Um, and the way we do this is we use an, a, a large interferometer, right? And we look for kind of deviations in our space coordinates, right? Um, and these deviations will then give us kind of oscillations in the intensity of our light that we can then translate to a signal. Um, so how does this look like in practice? Well, this is what the data looks like. Um, each LIGO detector, you get kind of a single stream of data and it comes in um, and then you start to search for, sorry, uh, pressing the wrong play button. So then you start to search for gravitational waves, right? So the data is coming in. Um, here you have your data. This is the strain. So this is the kind of distance um, in the interferometer. Um, and then you know what a gravitational wave will look like, or you have some hypothesis, and you can do a dot product, right, with your data and see if you get a match. 
Um, and that's basically what we're doing on the top. It's a little more sophisticated, but it's basically a dot product. And you can see that you suddenly get a large signal, right? Um, and that's really the challenge. Now, um, in order to, to do this, right, you don't, you can't just do this with a single detector. Um, we're talking about 10 to the minus 19 meters, uh, you know, kind of motion. Um, that means that, you know, if you sneeze in the wrong spot, it will affect your data, right? I mean, probably not a sneeze, but at least I know a thunderstorm right on the other side of the U.S. will affect, you know, this detector. It's incredibly sensitive. Um, and so the challenge here to kind of avoid these things is you just put multiple detectors. Um, and so now there's actually four gravitational wave detectors uh, on Earth. There's the two in the U.S., LIGO, um, Hanford, and Livingston. So one is in Washington State, one is in Louisiana. Um, and then you have a detector in, in Italy, Virgo, and in Japan, Kagra. Um, and to really identify a gravitational wave, we need to see it in two detectors, right? This is how we can avoid glitches, noises, these kinds of things. Um, and so here you have an example, right? So here's a very clear gravitational wave. This is after all, we've cleaned all the data, make it look nice. Um, this is in Hanford, this is in Livingston. You see they're you know, roughly the same size. You can align them and then you actually can see that these look like the same event. You're convinced and now you have a gravitational wave. I think this is the one that we actually, the first one we discovered. Um, the challenge of course is that um, you know, these plots look nice and easy, overlaying them looks very simple. Um, to get to this point is an incredible amount of kind of processing data, um, cleaning the data, and then actually identifying this type of topology. Um, so the challenge is can we do this all with AI, and can we do this ultimately as fast as we possibly can? Um, and the reason we want to do it so fast is that gravitational waves tend to come first, right? They move at the speed of light. Uh, they hit the Earth, and they can notify us if something is going on in the universe, right? Um, and so if we have, you know, a, an event, we'll see it with gravitational waves, and then we want to alert the rest of the world, right? Telescopes, um, you know, other detectors that something happened. Um, and ideally, if it's a telescope, we need to tell them where to look in the sky, right? Um, things like radio telescopes, right? They have they have to point in the sky, or just normal telescopes have to point in the sky. I mean, radio telescopes, you can, it's the pointings in software. Um, I, and so the point being is that you wanna alert them as fast as possible so that you don't miss the event. Um, the one event we've seen with the kind of telescope, so that we've seen visible spectrum and gravitational wave spectrum together, has actually led to enormous constraints on various physics, right, including you know, properties of nuclear matter. Right? So, um, it's incredibly important to see these events. Um, at the moment, we've only seen one. Well, there's maybe one other, but uh, anyway. Um, so how do we actually process LIGO data in, in kind of you know, workflow? We take the data in um, and we denoise it. We do it as fast as we can. Um, the data comes in, it's, about a, a, it's not that fast. It's about 10 kilohertz, right? So compared to other experiments, not super fast. Um, and then to calibrate it, we have 100,000 auxiliary channels that also come in. Right, and we basically do a kind of dot product or some sort of fast scheme of correlation with the auxiliary channels to kind of remove all the noises, and then we get a clean strain, right? Um, this is already a considerable amount of data. It's about a petabyte per year. Um, and so once we take this clean data, we can then start to look for the gravitational wave, right? And so we look for some ripples. We have ideas of what the topologies look like. We align the topologies, and then if we see something, Right, then it's an event, and now it's time to find the properties of that event. Where is it in the sky? Um, how far away is it? Um, what's the kind of uh, like inclination, angle, spin of the gravitational waves? Um, there's, there's actually a, a, many properties we can learn about um, the event once we see it. But we want to do this quickly, so we try to get the minimum amount, and we send an alert, and then we go. Um, so this is the kind of current workflow. There's kind of rule-based algorithms. Um, they're all CPU-based. They're all kind of built on conventional statistical tools. Um, and it's not the fastest thing, um, but it, you know, it works, right? Um, but you know, we're convinced that you know, we can do this whole thing um, faster and on GPUs. Um, and so um, this is our model that we have. And so we're developing the kind of infrastructure end to end to do this. Um, and the idea here is to kind of replace all these algorithms, right? Um, with AI-based algorithms and, you know, to take advantage of the fact that, you know, AI algorithms can go a little bit further than our rule-based algorithms um, and ultimately with heterogeneity, with GPUs and other heterogeneous computing, they can go even faster, right? Um, 
And so the nice thing is that this is almost a 100% ML-based setup that we have. Um, we have, I'll show you all these algorithms. We have kind of a full end-to-end -end pipeline already. Um, and so basically we can push almost everything, all the compute on the GPU. Um, and in light of that, we've been kind of developing a framework, um, an infrastructure we call ML for GW, which is a toolkit to enable kind of fast machine learning deployment for gravitational waves, and really to kind of leverage the fact that we can put as much speed up thing dramatically on the GPU. Um, and so the strategy here is to have kind of end-to-end -end pipeline for like development, and then ultimately an end-to-end -end pipeline for the deployment of these algorithms so we can actually deploy them at the LIGO site and process data in real time. Um, you know, and so this is what in the kind of industry toolkit they call ML ops or you know, machine learning operations. And really it, it starts from kind of you know, being a scientist, generating data, um, building appropriate simulation, you know, designing your algorithms, training it on, on, on you know, various simulation and data sets, um, and then you know, building a full scheme to kind of bookmark all of this and then connect all it together so that you can run this on kind of large data and you know, look for gravitational waves or deploy this in real time. Right? And that's the kind of scheme for our, our framework. Um, and so you know, what we're looking for are kind of two tasks, kind of training, developing algorithms, and inference, right, deploying these. Right? So in training, right, we're trying to kind of um, leverage, our strategy has been to kind of leverage the data sets we have at hand, put everything on the GPU, and actually train, um, actually keep our data you know, kind of cached on the GPU and do various augmentations in the training on the GPU. Um, this scheme allows us to train very efficiently. Um, we actually can do much of the simulation kind of on the fly uh, on the GPU. Um, like you can take a noise sample and you can kind of augment it, right? Um, modify your glitches, modify your signals, uh, all on the fly in the GPU. And so this is actually part of the toolkit we developed. Um, and then we have a full scheme to kind of deploy this to scale, right? So that if you want to run this on, you know, 10,000 years of data, you can, right? Um, and I'm going to show you a few examples. Now, I, I don't want to go through the details of our full framework, but I do want to highlight one kind of insight that we had in developing this framework, um, which actually goes to how we, you cache things on the GPU. So here's kind of a typical pipeline, right, for gravitational waves. You have a bunch of channels, right, um, coming in, right, this could be your signal or your witness channels, um, and they're coming in as a time, time series. So you get, you know, every, you know, every kind of, few milliseconds, you get a little more chunk of information. Um, and then the way we run a neural net is well, we take some window of time, right? Like we did when a, you know, we, we looked for a, like a gravitational wave, we did a dot product over a region. Um, and then we send this to a neural network and we get an output, right? Um, and then you take a kind of snapshot of the data, run the neural net, output a, a, a likelihood that this is a gravitational wave. And you keep going, right? So this would be the first snapshot here, you step a little bit forward, you take a second snapshot, you get a new output, right? Um, and so on and so forth. Now, immediately, I think you, you might notice that there's kind of a redundancy here, is that um, if you step forward, most of your data is the same, right? But now you want to run a new neural network inference, right? Naively on a GPU, if you do this, you basically treat this blue guy and this red guy as two separate neural network inferences, and you send the full data chunk to the, to the GPU. Um, so one of the things we developed was a caching scheme where we actually save the time series on the GPU. And so we only put in the new data that comes in onto the GPU and we have a kind of a stateful um, uh, caching on the GPU that allows us to kind of speed up the full, or, well, reduce the IO to the GPU, but then actually speed up the overall inference, right? Um, and this gave us something like, it's more than a factor of 10 speed up. Um, on top of this, right, this also kind of dramatically reduces the kind of network overhead. Um, and it allows us to kind of be more flexible in the way we do the whole processing of the data. So, so this is just one of the kind of many insights we've had in our, our toolkit um, that's allowed us to kind of speed up everything um, and make things more efficient. Um, all right. So the other thing that we did is we wanted to kind of use the standard tools for deploying machine learning to scale. Um, and so we relied on inference as a service, right? So the, in, the inference as a service paradigm, you build a kind of GPU or you, you leverage some GPU cluster, for example, the NRP, um, and you get a bunch of GPUs, you turn them into a big server. Um, if, 
if you have Kubernetes available, you can do kind of dynamic load balancing and allocation very efficiently. Um, and then you have a bunch of worker nodes that are just processing the data, sending the data to this big server, and the server is running all your ML algorithms, right? Um, and in fact, you know, we can we can stay fully cached, we can batch, we can do lots of efficient things on this giant uh, GPU server that allows us to kind of deploy things to scale. Um, and that's been kind of a big effort that we've been developing. Um, so I won't go into details of our software toolkit, but we have a software toolkit dedicated to inference as a service, it's called Hermes. Um, and kind of out of all of this, we've realized that uh, there's a lot of kind of modern kind of toolkits that we can kind of build on to allow us to kind of rapidly develop ML algorithms for uh, kind of machine learning operations for LIGO processing. Um, these are kind of the tools that we build on. Um, I think the one things I want to highlight is that everything is containerized, right? This enables maximum flexibility, right, across uh, various computing uh, infrastructures we have to deal with. Um, and kind of the fact that we have Kubernetes and we built around it has allowed us to distribute our servers uh, very efficiently. Um, there are other things to highlight here that, you know, we've, for example, this Luigi toolkit we took actually from Spotify. It's become a very popular toolkit for kind of task execution um, and deployment of, of algorithms in an efficient way. Um, so uh, building on this toolkit, we then wanted to go and use this. Um, so we looked at uh, kind of the possibility of kind of online deployment. Um, and this is something we are actively pursuing in LIGO. Um, but I want to highlight um, offline deployment where we actually do an end-to-end -end search of the data. So we're going to look at kind of data from a few years ago, um, and we're going to run ML algorithms, um, and we're going to use Nautilus, right? So we'll use um, Nautilus to actually, the Nautilus, Nautilus cluster to actually process our algorithms. Um, and an uh, important thing to, to kind of get you an idea of the level of compute we need, um, in order you, to claim you found kind of a signal, you need to run on a lot of pseudo data. Right, so here I actually have some fresh results, this isn't published yet, of uh, AI-based anomalies with an algorithm we developed called GWAC. Um, and this is, the y-axis here is the probability um, that this is a kind of false alarm. So um, here we, I'll just take this point, um, or I could take this point. Here we have an event that has a probability that it's kind of a fake signal um, that's one in about a thousand years, right? Um, so that means I have to run over a thousand years or, or even more, 10,000 years of data um, to kind of compute the probability, the likelihood that this event is fake, right? Um, and so in order to do this, you need to construct, you know, very large amounts of pseudo data and you need to process on the pseudo data to kind of, com you know, compute these false alarm rates. Um, and kind of the robust signals that we're looking for tend to be on the order of tens to hundreds to thousands of years, right? So one false alarm every kind of 10,000 years, right, is kind of the scale that we look, we go up to. Um, and to put this in context, well, um, our machine learning algorithms, we can run about, um, the vanilla ones before we optimize could run about 500 seconds for every second of, of, of 500 seconds of data within one real second of a GPU second, right? Um, with all our speed ups, we can get this up to about three to kind of 30,000 right, seconds of data per GPU second, which means that we need about um, kind of, you know, a third to three GPU years to process 10,000 years for one analysis. Now, this is for one GPU, right? So if you have a, a big cluster like NRP, right, you, let's say you have 500 GPUs, you can get this down to like a reasonable time scale. Um, but it's not a small compute, right, to kind of get this. Um, so given that, and given that we have a toolkit that, you know, we you know, built on containerized workloads, Kubernetes. I mean, all of this was kind of perfect for Nautilus. And so we were very happy to be um, one of the first users. Um, you know, we, before that we were using the LIGO data grid, which is kind of limited in terms of its GPU resources. Um, and so we went and we did this. This is kind of our, uh, just a diagram of our full scheme. It's, it's we're running CPUs actually and the LDG and then we're, or sorry, LIGO, the LIGO data grid, where we're actually taking the data and sending it to Nautilus, um, and um, that's this is kind of the full scheme. Uh, I'll skip, yeah, this is just some details. All right, so here's actually kind of a diagram. We run a load balancer, and then we kind of deploy a very large scale GPU service uh, in Nautilus um, that's talking to our actually uh, the LIGO data grid. So this is where we're actually reading the data. Um, and so our full infrastructure allows us to do this um, relatively easily um, and, and run things to scale. 
Um, and so, I, you know, this is all relatively new. Um, so I don't have published results yet, but uh, I can show you a few things that we have done so far. So I'll give you a little uh, whirlwind tour of some of the algorithms we have. So here we have a, a deep clean algorithm. So this takes in kind of detector inputs and witness channels, not all 100,000, but a few number, and it outputs a clean strain. And it, this does this on the fly. Um, and this is a kind of big improvement in the sense that you can now do real-time noise subtraction. You can go beyond linear subtraction is what the kind of previous algorithms were doing, and they, they weren't doing it completely real-time. Um, just as I mentioned, we actually benchmarked this algorithm as well um, on the FPGAs, right, uh, in, in Nautilus. Um, and, and mostly because we were testing out, we made an FPGA version of this deep clean algorithm um, kind of for testing future potential satellite uh, experiments and so on. Um, but this, it turned out it was a good, like the NRP was perfect for benchmarking this. Um, here's the kind of uh, algorithm where actually we've been heavily using Nautilus. Um, this is a binary black hole. Actually, it's a compact binary coalescence detector. So it's looking mostly for black hole mergers. Um, so you, the idea is you have your black hole merger up here. You have a neural network that takes a sliding window of time. And then it outputs a probability this is an event. So this is the blue is your output. And then you integrate this output. And you get kind of an integrated output. And the peak of your integrated output is going to be uh, your likelihood that this is a black hole merger. Um, so our algorithm, A-frame, turns out to be the most sensitive. So this is the kind of sensitive volume you can probe in, in gigaparsecs cubed. So, um, and these are all the kind of conventional rule base that are currently in the, the LIGO pipeline. There's, there's multiple algorithms in the pipeline. Um, and you can see that for kind of heavy black hole mergers, um, we can actually go uh, much further. Um, so the y-axis here is the false alarm, right? So. Um, there are other algorithms we have. So this is GWAC. This is a plot I showed you previously. This is an anomaly. This is, this is looking at uh, LIGO-based anomalies using AI anomaly detection algorithms. And suffice it to say, we, we can kind of probe very interesting physics here. Um, here we have a, an AI-based parameter estimation. So this is using the likelihood-free inference uh, scheme that's been developed recently. Um, so it actually, under the hood, if you're familiar, uses normalizing flows to compute the probability um, that you're where, of your the kind of probabilistic distribution of your gravitational wave. And out of this, you get a sky localization. So where in the sky is this event? Um, you also get various properties of the gravitational wave as well. Um, the nice thing is that with the machine learning, right, the kind of previous Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, fits could take minutes or even longer to run. Um, the machine learning algorithms can take, um, the kind of big ones take like 30 seconds to run. The kind of optimized ones that we're pursuing can even take you know, seconds or potentially less. So we're really kind of increasing our ability to process the data. Um, so here's actually our use case. So this is um, uh, our recent, um, this is our A-frame algorithm. So this is our binary black hole detection algorithm. So we're kind of heavily using the GPUs here. Um, and we have now kind of end-to-end -end infrastructure to continue doing this to scale. And I expect we're going to, th these numbers are just going to get higher and higher and higher. Um, now, Putting my kind of A3D3 uh, deputy director hat on, um, we wanted to scope the use of GPUs for big physics experiments. Um, and we wrote a white paper about this. And you can kind of map experiments onto an axis um, where you look at the throughput, right, in kind of events per hour, and the kind of core hours you need per event. And you can kind of match this to the amount of computing you need. Um, these two red guys, A-frame and Deep Clean, are the kind of two of the algorithms I showed you. Dingo is actually um, or an earlier version of the parameter estimation for gravitational waves. And, and the message here is that maybe LIGO is not the kind of highest throughput, um, but it's definitely in need of very large compute, right? These are complex algorithms to see these subtle, you know, kind of deviations. Um, and you can read more about the details of this. We, we wrote a white paper. We also looked at CPU usage. Um, the LHC is also on here for comparison. And I just want to say that, you know, I showed you for LIGO, um, this inference is a service paradigm, but um, there's an active effort um, to pursue this for the LHC, for neutrino physics, um, both in Dune and IceCube, um, as well as to do this for other things as well. Um, and the nice thing is we're trying to share as much of this toolkit across many experiments. Um, I think we want to call this kind of combination of algorithms supersonic, but I, I don't think we settled on the name yet. Um, so what did we learn from all of this? And what is critical? Um, computing demands are needed. You need special infrastructure for ML deployment, right? Um, 
things should be critically connected. You need to be able to load balance GPU and CPU resources, and it varies dramatically per experiment. The LIGO workflow is almost all GPU. Other workflows that we know, like neutrino or Halachi physics, are very small amount GPU at the moment. Um, and so being able to balance these dynamically is very important. Um, inference differs from training, so you need to be able to understand this approach that the way you kind of cache and send data is different. Um, and exploiting these, these toolkits are, are important, right? We, we learned with our training in our ML for GW toolkit, we could cache much of the kind of signal generation on the GPU to make it much faster. Um, the second thing to mention is that the software stack is also critical. And I, I, I you know, my, I've had, I've run similar workflows now at a number of different computing sites. And I have to say the NRP is the most modern kind of forward thinking um, that, that I've experienced. Um, and I, you know, I, I'd like to think that, you know, keeping these containerization ideas, you know, running Kubernetes, this is a way forward, especially for machine learning workflows. Um, and then, of course, right, we should be aware that the, the machine learning problems are diverse, right? We're not just all doing large language models. Um, we should highlight the kind of importance of other things like real time as well. Um, you know, this is just a timeline just to show that LIGO and, you know, our friends at the LHC um, are also going to be running for the next kind of 10 years and, and there's going to be more and more need for computing. So um, thanks. All right, just this is a summary. That's an extraordinary talk, and it, he's absolutely right. This is the future. It's so fortunate for all of us to get a glimpse as early in as it is uh, from Phil. Uh, the LHC has shown the way for large uh, systems, but uh, LIGO has been really tough uh, five decades to get here. Uh, anyway, uh, questions? Then thank you, Phil. Re really interesting question. Do these algorithms work better for better or worse in certain regimes like higher masses, lower masses, higher or lower yeah. mass ratios? Yeah, so um, it, I mean, I'm showing you the higher mass because it's the kind of outperforms everybody. But if you go to lower mass, it doesn't. Um, okay. This is a very active discussion um, that we're going through right now. Um, there are, you know, when you go to lower masses, kind of you want to deal with longer time scales, right? Um, the neural network architecture that we're dealing with, you know, seems to be more optimized for kind of shorter, very, you know, like kind of fast mergers. Mm -hmm. um, so these are things that we're looking at, um, kind of, at the moment. And and you know, I think there are solutions, but um, we're certainly early on in the exploration. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Mark. Well, thanks so much, Phil. Um